Uh, my name is Maria Carolambides. I am a reader in the mechanical engineering department of Imperial College. Uh, my group, my research group that I lead, um, is called Soft Solids, um, which studies the formation and fracture uh, properties of soft solids. Uh, this is um, polymers, uh, both biopolymers and synthetic. What I'll be talking to you about today is uh, our work on the fruit biopolymers work. So the title of my uh, presentation today is Mechanics of Soft Solid Foods, Effect of Microstructure on Bath Behavior. Okay, um, so um, the aim of my uh, group research is to build predictive models for determining how food behaves and whether this is industrial or um, uh, a human, like an oral or gastric process. Um, and we want to answer questions like what's the impact of the process on uh, the food material? Because um, if the food material gets impacted, that will have a direct um, impact on the consumer perception, which of course is what the food industry is interested in. Um, so if you're going to build a predictive computational model, um, for example, here I have a case of where we uh, produced a model for the sheeting of um, dough, bread dough. Uh, then we need to input inside this um, computational uh, models um, material properties for the piece that's been processed, so dough here, uh, the geometry, um, for example, the raw here, uh, the radius, and so on, um, and the boundary conditions, the speed, <clears throat> the rolling speed, the thickness of the, the gap here, and so on. Uh, once you have a computational model, you want to have some experiments such that you can validate your um, uh, computational model. And once you're confident that this model is um, accurate, you can use it to um, have efficient ways for optimizing um, your process and therefore your product design. Okay, uh, for those of you who don't know what finite element methods are, because this is what these computational models are based on, very quick uh, overview. It's a numerical technique for um, solving um, field equations. Um, it's very heavily used in structural analysis, for example, um, which enables you to um, analyze complicated shapes and complicated loading for which there are no uh, mathematical models available. Um, the final element model will output displacements and stresses in your model. And it does this by dividing the structure that you're analyzing into smaller pieces or elements uh, with simple shapes. Um, and equations can be derived for individual elements. The complicated structure, therefore, is modeled by assembly of lots of elements. The elements are connected together at the nodes. And it's not an exact method, but it's extremely accurate. Um, modern programs uh, hide all this detail and are very automated. And I'm going to be showing you now um, examples of this work. Uh, sorry, I don't know what that, what that happened. OK, um, all right. So these are examples of where this final element method has, uh, is used in engineering. So for example, here you can see um, um, a car chassis is divided into these elements I was talking about. And at the edge of each element, there's notes. And they're heavily used, uh, these methods, for the um, automotive and aerospace industry, as for the examples here because you cannot have any mathematical equations that enable you to solve such complicated problems. OK, so we've used this method for um, modeling industrial processes. So for example, here I have cutting. So this is a model that we built for cutting of cheese by a wire. <coughs> this is the one I showed you earlier, which is the um, rolling of a bread dough. And this is extrusion process. So all of these are um, models that we developed such that we can mimic the real process. And then instead of having to do the pilot scale trial and error um, uh, studies, which are very expensive and inefficient, you can do it all at least the first stage on virtually on a computer. OK, um, the, that was industrial processes. For the next is the human processes. So what happens when the food gets eaten, for example? That's important because it will affect consumer perception or um, further down uh, in the body, how food behaves during the gastric process. And this is important because we want to link um, the structure of the food and how it breaks down uh, during the gastric process and to the bioavailability of the macronutrients, because this, of course, affects consumer health. 
So I'll be showing you some of these results here that we have. Um, so the food industry, what they do, they have sensory panels, and you do, um, <clears throat> um, we decide on what uh, sensorial attributes you want to um, uh, um, measure for your materials that you want to um, study. Um, however, it's well known that this sort of um, measurements, firmness, springiness, disintegration, deformability, and so on, these are for cheeses and all the study that we've done, are heavily dependent on the mechanical properties of your materials. However, if you eat a small piece of cheese or a large piece of cheese, um, the forces that you will sense in your mouth will be different, not because the properties are different, but because the geometry is different. So it's not enough to just measure these material properties and link them to the sensorial properties. You also need um, to have a chewing model, a simulation. So this is some work that we've done on um, um, uh, products which are sold for cleaning pet teeth, um, dog's teeth. So um, this, for example, here shows um, a test that we've done where we 3D printed teeth from um, uh, the back molar teeth of a, a dog. Um, and then this is the piece. And we were studying, we were measuring here the force needed. And we, from the videos, we can get the deformations. Um, so here's the force that we're measuring up here, and the displacement is the movement down here. Um, and when we build the model and we can put them side by side, you can see that they're quite, um, uh, they're quite, uh, the model is quite good. It replicates uh, the deformations that and the fracture that we're seeing in the piece. But also quantitatively, the forces that we're getting and displacement from the model and the experiments are very, very close. Um, and then you can see more clearly on the still images, you know, this is before um, just um, initial indentation, then as the tooth digs in, and then you go to this stage here, and finally here, you can see that we have very close uh, um, simulation of the uh, separation. Um, and that then allows us to use the model to see what kind of forces and friction and shear are um, applied on the teeth, such as you can see how efficient this uh, product is for cleaning the tooth, for example. Okay, so uh, the last example I'll show you on these um, um, models where we use, we don't actually use the microstructure, we just treat the material as uh, a bulk, is the gastric process. So here's your stomach, <clears throat> and then the food gets um, processed. It goes through this uh, stenosis here, the pyloric sphincter, and then into the small intestine. Um, so we want to model the mechanical aspect of this only at the moment, to, because when you have food inside your uh, stomach, it will also be um, degraded chemically and will also be hydrated. But it will also be uh, squashed from this, um, uh, you see here, these uh, motions, the peristaltic motion of the stomach, and that's the bit that we're concentrating on at the moment. Um, this is the axis of symmetry, of the geometry, and because it's quite complicated in 3D, we've uh, simplified it. <coughs> by having a straight um, symmetry axis. So this is what um, we're modeling. Um, and these are the boundary conditions. So we're having contractions from 40% to 90%, and this is the speed. So um, we have, this is the, the stomach here. Just ignore this box that outside. It's called the Eulerian box, and it's something that we're doing to make our models um, run. Uh, and this is the food, you know, the, the bolus um, uh, food, which is going to get broken down in the stomach due to this peristaltic motion, so the pink stuff. And you can see here, there's a sphincter. So basically, the food uh, breaks down into smaller pieces as it goes through. And it's this um, how, um, how big this surface area, the new surface area that is generated per, per given volume or the initial volume which will then, we're going to link it to nutrition. So basically, a new surface area is created when this material is broken down. Now, so far, in all the examples I've shown you, we treated the, the food here, the bolus, or before, you know, for the industrial processes and the chewing, as a material which was uniform. However, a lot of these foods, when you look at them under the microscope, they, they're very intricate. They have a very intricate microstructure. And this microstructure impacts on the material properties that you put as input into your, into your computational models. So what we want to do is we want to be able to go to a scale, um, a lower scale than our processes, uh, and study what the effect of this microscale is on the mechanical properties of the food, 
which will then be fed into the larger scale model, whether it's an industrial process or a human process. And somehow we want to link uh, the two. We need to bridge, bridge these um, scales. Um, I've got three examples here, which I'll show you some work that we've done. So if you look at these wafer biscuits here, they're very um, popular um, products in the confectionery industry. Um, and if you look at them under SCM, this is what they look like. It's a cellular material, which gives a crispiness that <coughs> the consumer um, 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 associate with such products. Um, here is the um, um, a piece of dough. And again, if you look at it under cryo SCM, you're going to look at um, these particulate spaces, which are the starch particles in a continuous space, which is the protein matrix. And here is a piece of gelatin being squashed. And again, under the microscope, this is 100 nanometers. Um, a gel is basically a solid, it's a two phase system, which is a solid network uh, with pores where some of the water is free to flow through these pores. So we were inspired to look at these microstructures and see how these microstructures impact on the mechanical properties that you sense on the bigger scale when you're eating it, when you're cutting it, or when you're processing it on the plant. So on the bulk scale, the bigger scale, so here I've got some compression tests where we've done um, uh, wafers here. So basically we had a few of those sheets and we stack them together and you squash them and you're measuring stress strain. Um, initially, you're going to get um, an elastic response here. And then once these um, cells or the layers here start breaking, every time it breaks, you get a drop in force. When they're all broken and they're disintegrated into powder, then you get this region here, which is called a densification. So you're basically just compacting powder at this case. And this is a very um, <clears throat> um, common behavior that you see in any foams, whether they're foods or um, structural foams. So you've got the elastic region. This region here is where um, the straps of your cells are starting to break. And it's called the plateau region because, on average, the stresses are constant. <coughs> OK, now, um, this I showed you earlier. This is the microstructure of one of these um, wafers here. And this slide was all about bulk behavior. If you look at this on the micro scale, so these are basically tests that we've done inside the SEM, then you can see what happens is that at this uh, region here, where we have very large cores and very thin cell walls, they start breaking down first here. Um, uh, and then once that's broken, but once that's broken down, then the skin will break and then everything turns into powder and you have densification. Now, there's two factors here that we want to study. So basically, the bulk behavior that we measure when we're crushing this, some of it is because of the geometry of the cell, cells here, and some of it is due to the material that makes these cells, you know, the properties of that solid material. And you want to be able to um, study these two separately, and the only way to do that is through a model. Um, you cannot create another foam uh, we will have the same geometry, but a different solid raw material and vice versa. So this is why we wanted to build the model. Now, to get the three-dimensional um, architecture of the cells, uh, we use X-ray microtomography, tomography. And you get 2D image slices, which are used to reconstruct a three-dimensional volume, um, as shown here. OK, so this is your three-dimensional volume showing um, uh, all the, um, the pores. Um, this uh, then is fed into computational models such that um, um, we mesh them. So that's what those little grids were when you see them uh, the next. So this is all one solid, and then it's discretized. It's split into tiny little elements, as is shown here, tetrahedral ones. And then what you can do is to fit these into your final element models, and you can run your um, compression simulation. And you can see that the cells are breaking um, uh, in the middle here, and you're getting a response from the model in this black line here, <coughs> which is very similar to experimental points and curves. So this gives us confidence that the model works, and then you can start playing around with it, changing the solid wall material, changing the pore sizes, the cell wall thicknesses easily, and seeing what the effect is without having to do um, experiments. And as I said earlier, some of them would be impossible to do experimental in any case. So we're using this at the moment, for example, to study why materials which are made through baking. This sort of wafer I've shown you was made by baking, traditional baking uh, between hot plates. We want to see why when you make extruded shapes, 
you get different some sort of um, properties, and we were able to show what the differences were, both for the solid wall material and the architecture by using this method. So these are the extruded shapes down here. Okay, um, the second uh, microstructural uh, example I'm going to show you is the dough. I showed you this earlier. <coughs> Apologies. <coughs> I have um, a starch particles here inside the gluten continuous matrix. So in engineering, this is called a composite material, okay, because it's composed of two materials. Now, we know that the starch is stiffer than the gluten. So in engineering, you would know that if you take a material um, and then you put inside stiffer bits, like in particles, then the behavior should be stiffer than the matrix alone. And then if you show here the behavior and stress strain, so stress is a measure of the force and strain is a measure of how much is deformed, um, we see um, the, the composite, which is the dough, is indeed stiffer than the gluten to begin with, but then there's a crossover point. And the composite then becomes weaker than the matrix, which is odd because we put in this stiffer material. So we wanted to find out why is this happening. Um, and we had some initial um, ideas, which was that the, um, these two phases are not perfectly bonded here. And that the interface here is weak. And therefore, around some point here, we're going to start getting the bonding between the two uh, phases. And this is why the curves cross over. Um, so when you want to build a model based on the microstructure, <clears throat> engineers basically uh, know what properties you need to tailor to get the desired material properties. Your, um, if you're designing this material, um, then your free variables, if you like, if you could, would be volume fraction, how much of these particles you're going to put in, the size and the geometry of these particles, the material properties of the matrix, the continuous phase, here is the protein, the material properties of the particular phase, the starch here, and the interface, as I said earlier. So all of these things need to be taken into account. And because it's such a complex material, um, protein and starch are bio biopolymers. They're very nonlinear uh, materials, uh, go to large strains. Um, and highly dissipated, there isn't an analytical solution that you can just plug in your values and get the answer in. So the only way um, when you want to include the bonding as well is through a computational model. So we have a microstructure of a dough here. We first binarize it. <coughs> such that we can split the two phases easily. And then we fit this microstructure inside um, finite element analysis um, uh, models. And then we use a, what's called a cohesive zone model for the interface. So basically, if you imagine you have an interface which is perfectly stuck, um, as you try and separate it, so as you try and put a displacement, this is displacement here, you're going to feel a stress because it's well bonded to begin with. You're going to feel a resistance. However, when you reach a point here, your um, uh, interface starts damaging, okay? So your resistance that you feel starts dropping down and eventually it will reach zero. So at that point, the two surfaces are completely separate. So we've introduced this model between the starch particles and the matrix, the continuous matrix. And this color here, the red, shows you when there's debonding taking place, when the particles are getting unstuck. This is model was done from tensor. And you can um, uh, see that if we validate this model and we know it's working, then you can start changing around the particle size distribution, how it's, how it's arranged, because what you can see is that the, the damage, is the, the bonding is happening first at the larger particles, and that's a well-known effect because the stresses are higher there. <coughs> and also around particles which are very close to each other. So here, for example, you see we've got two particles which are very close to each other, very high stress builds up, and this is why you have the bonding. Um, and this is how this model, the red line, uh, fits with experimental data uh, derived from laboratory tests where you take a piece of dough, you know, just a lump of dough now, you're not really looking at the microstructure, but you're squashing it in compression, in tension, in shear. Um, and then this is also compression, but loading and loading. And you can see that um, it's okay, the model, but it needs some improvement, but it's actually um, um, a, a quite good uh, uh, replicate of uh, what's happening in practice. The last example I'll show you is some work that we've done on gels. Um, gelatin is a two-component substance, so it's basically a solid network, as is shown here, in a liquid phase. Um, so um, <coughs> for this material, um, there's two things going on at the same time. There's two phenomena. 
One is that the solid material that makes the network here, uh, it's a solid, so it gets stressed. It might damage, it might have starts getting cracks. So this is a crack, uh, the tip of a crack. At the um, tip of the crack, we assume that there's a zone in front of, a, uh, of the crack tip where all the um, uh, fracture processes are starting to develop, like micro cracking, um, voids, and so on. Uh, and this is a very common way of modeling cracks in this field, which is called fracture mechanics. At the same time, you also have fluids which could flow in this pores. Okay, so this is your channel of diameter D, and you have a velocity profile as shown here. So both of these things are happening simultaneously in this material. And the end effect is that if you take this gel and you squash it at different rates, I've got some results here of uh, stress strain for two different gels. One is a stronger gel because we put more powder, higher uh, powder per water ratio. Um, and this one is a 5%. And each, each of these two materials is tested at three different rates. And you can see that um, the curves end where I started seeing fractures in this material. And the slow speed tests, the fracture uh, stresses and strain are smaller than the medium intermediate um, speed. And at a very high speed, you get, uh, you're able to um, squash your sample a lot more before you start seeing um, cracks developing. Whereas this bit, the curves here, the deformation bit, is almost the same, it's independent of the rate, which was very odd because um, in materials engineering, usually when you have fracture properties which are dependent on uh, rate, usually the whole curve is dependent on rate, whereas here it looks like they're the same. Here. Um, another test that we did was uh, wire cutting, as you shown here. We got a wire, we push it inside a piece of gel. Um, when you push a wire inside a gel, you create, you breaking it into two components, so you're creating two new surface areas. And if you measure the energy that you put in by um, pressing this uh, wire down, then and the areas, the new areas that you uh, have created, as a result, you can measure the fracture energy that you need to put in, which is what this thing is here. GC, the fracture energy, which is a material parameter, just like modular season, uh, fracture stress. And you can see at the low rates, <coughs> so when you do this, um, when you move this wire down slowly, you do not have much of a, an effect. Whereas when you, um, you know, you have a constant G, whereas when you are increasing your rate, you get much higher fracture energy. So you need to put in a lot more energy to, to um, cut your uh, piece. Um, and again, we were wondering why that was. We made some um, analytical model together with my colleagues, which is shown here, um, which says that the patch energy indeed came out to be proportional to the speed of zero, 0 0.5, such that when you plot your log of GC versus the log of rate, these are my experimental data. This is the trend line I fitted, and you can see the slope here is 0 0.5. It matches very well the analytical model. Okay, and this analytical model was developed from these two processes I've shown earlier. So basically what we've realized is that at the low rate, there's no effect of fluid flow. Imagine you have a sponge with water in it. If you try and squash it slowly, um, the fluid does not offer much resistance. It just slows out. At higher rates though, um, because it's much harder to push the, the fluid through the pores, the contribution from this forcing the water through the pores is significant, and therefore you need to put in a much larger energy to create your gel. And, uh, Lastly here, we also did a simulation of a compression test. Um, and uh, in, with a finite element analysis model, and inside here, we defined our gel as a, what's known a poro elastic model. So basically, we told it that it's a material which is a solid network with pores where the fluid can flow through in a way. And as a result of that, I can output how much pressure is in the fluid that's going through the pores and how much is in the solid skeleton. So if I run my simulations at the three different rates, so the red points are the low rate, the green uh, is the intermediate rate, and the blue is the fast speed, fast speed are going down. <coughs> I can separate how much um, contribution I have from the water. So these three curves are from the water and the pore pressure, and the three top curves is the stress that's in the solid. So you can see the red curves, which is the slow rate, I hardly have any effect from the contribution of the fluid flowing through the pores. And my, as, an, as an effect, my stress uh, in the solid network is very high. So all the stress is taken by the solid. As I increase my rate, my fluid is starting to help. It's taking some of the stress, if you like, some of the pressure, 
and that means my solid stress is reducing, and so on for the blood. So if I then say that my gel breaks when the solid network breaks, I know from experiment at this low rate, the strain was between 0.9 and 1, um, then I can define this um, region here, 13 to 18 kilopascals as my fracture criterion. So when I reach this stress in my solid network, network then I know my um, gel will fracture. And then if I come across on the green curve, intermediate curve, I'm predicting, therefore, a fracture strain between 1 and 1.2, which agrees very well with experimental values of 1.1 and 1.2. And for the blue, I'm predicting 1.2 to 1.4, which predicts, um, agrees pretty well with a strain of 1.6. <coughs> okay, so um, my conclusions. Apologies for... Um, I've got this uh, nasty cold at the moment. Um, this sort of work that my group does is very important because um, it can unlock some secrets for the food industry. Um, it can establish links between the microstructure and the bulk behavior, such that you have new modeling tools for product design. Um, whether this is um, because uh, you wanted to product design to study the human gastric or oral process or the industrial manufacturing process. Um, so you can optim you can use these models to optimize industrial food processing. Um, you can use them to understand the impact of various process parameters <coughs> at both the micro and the macro scale. Okay, so imagine you're doing your sheeting of the rolling um, rolling of a piece of dough. Uh, what we're working on at the moment is to try and have that microstructure, that particular microstructure as a smaller scale inside that big material that's getting compressed as it goes through the rows. What happens to the microstructure as it's getting squished between the rows? Um, and it can also help to investigate the uh, oral and gastric processes, which is a really uh, interesting multidisciplinary field which links structure to consumer perception and health. And all of this work can be used to design better nutritious products through understanding this important link between the structure and the bulk response. Um, acknowledgement uh, here today I showed uh, work from uh, various members of my group, uh, some of my academic collaborators and industrial collaborators as well. So thank you very much um, and this is it.